What's going on, Space Monkeys? Welcome to Political Fight Club. I'm Robert Durden. We're going to continue with the book club. We're going to start a new book today. I know I told you guys that we were going to do Oliver Stone's Untold History of the U.S. We are going to do that one, but I stumbled across another book that's a little bit shorter, a little bit easier for me to do. I'm going to do this over my summer break, and then when we get back to season four, we'll start the Oliver Stone, Peter Kuznick book. So um, I've never read Mao before, but I found a copy of On Guerrilla Warfare by Mao. Uh, I have read snippets of Mao, but never a book that he wrote, and this one intrigued me specifically because, well, one, it was 50 cents, and uh, two, what I like to do with PFC-style politics is guerrilla warfare, but in the information war that we're going to have to fight online. That's why I'm all about collecting as much information about my opponents, i.e. the corporate propagandists and other commentators who I think are spewing imperialist and corporatist garbage. And I'm all for gathering everybody from writers, journalists, commentators, memers, songwriters, musicians, all that stuff together and to create an army that's going to drown them out and destroy them. That's kind of my thing. So I thought that even though this book, it was written in 1937 when Imperial Japan was at war with China. And it's about how, I only read the first chapter, and we're going to read the first chapter today. It's about how guerrilla warfare operations are integral with winning an overall war. And I think that PFC is a part of those guerrilla operations. We don't do things conventionally, certainly. I certainly don't. And I know people that follow me and do things kind of the way that I do, but in a different vein of commentary. They believe in the same stuff. So I thought we might ascertain and glean some... In important information by kind of reading this out loud and it's only six chapters long it won't take me very long maybe a couple of weeks so that was the other reason I picked it over the uh, that kitten squisher over there it's about a thousand pages long we'll get to that in season four so this is on guerrilla warfare by Mao chapter one what is guerrilla warfare in a war of revolutionary character guerrilla operations are a necessary part this is particularly true in war waged for the emancipation of a people who inhabit a vast nation. China is such a nation, a nation whose techniques are undeveloped and whose communications are poor. She finds herself confronted with a strong and victorious Japanese imperialism. Under these circumstances, the development of the type of guerrilla warfare characterized by the quality of mass is both necessary and natural. This warfare must be developed to an unprecedented degree and it must coordinate with the operations of our regular armies. If we fail to do this, we will find it difficult to defeat the enemy. These guerrilla operations must not be considered as an independent form of warfare. They are but one step in the total war, one aspect of the revolutionary struggle. They are the inevitable result of the clash between oppressor and oppressed when the latter reach the limits of their endurance. In our case, these hostilities began at a time when the people were unable to endure any more from the Japanese imperialists. Lenin, in People and Revolution, said, quote, A people's insurrection and a people's revolution are not only natural but inevitable. We consider guerrilla operations as but one aspect of our total mass war because they, lacking the quality of independence, are of themselves incapable of providing a solution to the struggle. Guerrilla warfare has qualities and objectives peculiar to itself. It is a weapon that a nation inferior in arms and military equipment may employ against a more powerful aggressor nation. When the invader pierces deep into the heart of the weaker country and occupies her territory in a cruel and oppressive manner, there is no doubt the conditions of terrain, climate, and society in general offer obstacles to his progress and may be used to advantage by those who oppose him. In guerrilla warfare, we turn these advantages to the purpose of resisting and defeating the enemy. And in our case in PFC, we must use our advantages on the internet that the mainstream and legacy media have not exploited yet. We're better at this than they are. We can beat them because the internet is our territory. During the progress of hostilities, guerrillas gradually develop into orthodox forces that operate in conjunction with other units of the regular army. Thus the regularly organized troops, those guerrillas who have attained that status, and those who have not reached that level of development combine to form the military power of a national revolutionary war. 
there can be no doubt that the ultimate result of this will be victory. Both in its development and its method of application, guerrilla warfare has certain distinctive characteristics. We must first discuss the relationship of guerrilla warfare to national policy. Because ours is the resistance of a semi-colonial country against an imperialist one, our hostilities must have a clearly defined political goal and firmly established political responsibilities. Our basic policy is the creation of a national, united, anti-Japanese front. This policy we pursue in order to gain our political goal, which is the complete emancipation of the Chinese people. And my goals with PFC are very clear. They're written out in the rules, but our goal is to destroy corporate propaganda, destroy that apparatus, and replace it with indie media. And that has always been it, what it has been since day one. We're going to go after that and keep our eye on that prize. There are certain fundamental steps necessary to the realization of this policy to wit, one, arousing and organizing the people, two, achieving internal unification politically, three, establishing bases, four, equipping forces, five, recovering national strength, six, destroying the enemy's national strength, and seven, regaining lost territories. There is no reason to consider guerrilla warfare separately from national policy. On the contrary, it must be organized and conducted in complete accord with national anti-Japanese policy. It is only those who misinterpret guerrilla action who say, as does Zhen Shishan, quote, the question of guerrilla hostilities is purely a military matter and not a political one. Those who maintain this simple point of view have lost sight of the political goal and the political effects of guerrilla warfare. Such a simple point of view will cause the people who lo to lose confidence and will result in our defeat. What is the relationship of guerrilla warfare to the people? Without a political goal, guerrilla warfare must fail, as it must, as if political objectives do not coincide with the aspirations of the people and their sympathy, cooperation, and assistance cannot be gained. The essence of guerrilla warfare is thus revolutionary in character. On the other hand, in a war of counter-revolutionary nature, there is no place for guerrilla hostilities, because guerrilla warfare basically derives from the masses and is supported by them. It can neither exist nor flourish if it separates itself from their sympathies and cooperation. There are those who do not comprehend guerrilla action and who therefore do not understand the distinguishing qualities of a people's guerrilla war who say, quote, only regular troops can carry on guerrilla operations. There are others who, because they do not believe in the ultimate success of guerrilla action, mistakenly say, quote, guerrilla warfare is an insignificant and highly specialized type of operation in which there is no place for the masses of the people, Jin Shishan. Then are those, there are those who ridicule the masses and undermine resistance by wildly asserting that the people have no understanding of the war of resistance. Ye Qing, for one. The moment that this war of resistance dissociates itself from the masses of the people is the precise moment that it dissociates itself from the hope of ultimate victory over the Japanese. Amen to that. Indie media and this army that we build online must always be of and for the people. Once it starts taking corporate money, I exclude you from PFC because you're not part of a revolution anymore. That's why I went after people who sold out, and that's why one of the rules of PFC is you can't sell out. Because then, once you sell out to the people that you will buy you out, the capitalists, the imperialists, it's no longer a revolution. They nerf you, and you become like breaking points, TYT, all that stuff. It's against the rules. What is the organization for guerrilla warfare? Though all guerrilla brands that spring from the masses of the people suffer from lack of organization at the time of their formation, they all have in common a basic quality that makes organization possible. All guerrilla units must have political and military leadership. This is true regardless of the source or size of such units. Such units may originate locally in the masses of the people. They may be formed from an admixture of regular troops with groups of people or they may consist of regular army units intact. And mere quantity does not affect this matter. Such units may consist of a squad of a few men, 
a battalion of several hundred men, or a regiment of several thousand men. All these must have leaders who are unyielding in their policies, resolute, loyal, sincere, and robust. These men must be well-educated in revolutionary technique, self-confident, able to establish severe discipline, and able to cope with counter-propaganda. In short, these leaders must be models for the people. As the war progresses, such leaders' lack of discipline, which at first will gradually overcome the lack of discipline which at first prevails, they will establish discipline in their forces, strengthening them and increasing their combat efficiency. Thus, eventual victory will be attained. And in my case, and a lot of these other networks' case, like Revolutionary Blackout Network, we try to teach everybody who listens to us how to have that revolutionary discipline, that rhetorical discipline online so that you can win arguments, but not just win. Arguments are not to be won. Arguments are be to be had and learned from. And if you're a true Marxist, revolutionary, communist, the idea should not be to win the argument. It should be to convince as many people who are listening to the argument that you're right and that they should join you and that they should try to be like you and try to change their mind over to your Marxist ideas. And it's not that hard. In a country that is failing like ours is in the U.S. right now, it's very easy to get people to hate capitalism. It's really not hard. But you have to have revolutionary discipline, and you must also not be reactionary. It's, that's another thing that's difficult on the left, I found, especially in the United States with political commentators that I interact with. Many of these are reactionaries who want to flip out on anybody and anybody for any reason if they disagree for the tiniest little thing. That's not discipline. Those people are not helping. They're counter-revolutionary. Unorganized guerrilla warfare cannot contribute to a victory, and those who attack the movement as a combination of banditry and anarchism do not understand the nature of guerrilla action. They say, this movement is a haven for disappointed militarists, vagabonds, and bandits, according to Jen Shishan, hoping thus to bring the movement into disrepute. Have we seen that lately? Yes, we have. We do not deny that there are corrupt guerrillas, nor that there are people who, under the guise for guerrillas, un indulge in unlawful activities. Neither do we deny that the movement has, at the present time, symptoms of a lack of organization, symptoms that we might indeed be serious, or might indeed be serious, were we to judge a guerrilla warfare solely by the corrupt and temporary phenomena we have mentioned. We should study the corrupt phenomena and attempt to eradicate them in order to encourage guerrilla warfare and to increase its military efficiency. Quote, this is hard work. There is no help for it, and the problem cannot be solved immediately. The whole people must try to reform themselves during the course of this war. We must educate them and reform them in the light of past experience. Evil does not exist in guerrilla warfare, but only in the unorganized and undisciplined activities that are anarchism. And that was Lenin in um, Lenin. What is basic guerrilla strategy? Guerrilla strategy must be based primarily on alertness, alertness, mobility, and attack. It must be adjusted to the enemy situation, the terrain, the existing lines of commu communication, the relative strengths, the weather, and the situation of the people. In guerrilla warfare, select the tactic of seeming to come from the east and attacking from the west. Avoid the solid attack, at a solid attack the hollow, attack, withdraw, deliver a lightning blow, seek a lightning decision. When guerrillas engage a stronger enemy, they withdraw when he advances, harass him when he stops. I like that one. Harass him when he stops, strike him when he is weary, pursue him when he withdraws. In guerrilla strategy, the enemy's rear, flanks, and other vulnerable spots are his vital points and there he must be harassed, attacked, dispersed, exhausted, and annihilated. Only in this way can guerrillas carry out their mission of independent guerrilla action and coordination with the effort of the regular armies. But, in spite of the most complete preparation, there can be no victory if mistakes are made in the matter of command. Guerrilla warfare, based on the principles we have mentioned, and carry out over a vast extent of territory in which the communications are inconvenient, will contribute tremendously towards ultimate defeat of the Japanese and consequent emancipation of the Chinese people. 
A careful distinction must be made between two types of guerrilla warfare. The fact that revolutionary guerrilla warfare is based on the masses of the people does not itself mean that the organization of guerrilla units is impossible in a war of counter-revolutionary character. As examples of the former type, we may cite red guerrilla hostilities during the Russian Revolution, those of the Abyssinians against the Italians for the past three years, those of the last seven years in Manchuria, and the vast anti-Japanese guerrilla war that is carried out on China today. All these struggles have been carried out in the interest of the whole people or the greater part of them. All had a broad basis in the national manpower and all had a had been in accord with the laws of historical development. They have existed and will continue to exist, flourish, and develop as long as they are not contrary to national policy. The second type of guerrilla warfare directly contradicts the law of historical development. Of this type, we may cite the examples furnished by the white Russian guerrilla units organized by Denikin and Kolchak. Those organized by the Japanese those organized by the Italians in Abyssinia, those supported by the puppet governments in Manchuria and Mongolia, and those that will be organized here by Chinese traders. All such have oppressed the masses and have been contrary to the true interests of the people. They must be firmly opposed. They are easy to destroy because they lack a broad foundation in the people. Yep. Nobody likes the mainstream media. Legacy media is broadly hated by everybody who's not 75 years of age or older. They're vulnerable right now. We can beat them online by creating as much indie media content that tells the truth to the people as humanly possible and attacking them while they go extinct. We can make them go extinct faster. That's PFC politics. If we fail to differentiate between these two types of guerrilla hostilities, it is likely that we will exaggerate their effect when applied by an invader. We might arrive at the conclusion that the invader can organize guerrilla units from among the people. Such a conclusion might well diminish our confidence in guerrilla warfare. As far as this matter is concerned, we have but to, to remember the historical experience of revolutionary struggles. Further, we must distinguish general revolutionary wars from those of a purely class type. In the former case, the whole people of a nation, without regard to class or party, carry on a guerrilla struggle that is an instrument of the national policy. Of a general guerrilla war, it has been said, quote, when a nation is invaded, the people become sympathetic to one another and all aid in organizing guerrilla units. In civil war, no matter to what extent guerrillas are developed, they do not produce the same results as when they are formed to resist an invasion by foreigners. The one strong feature of guerrilla warfare in a civil struggle is its quality of internal purity. One class may be easily united and perhaps fight with great effect, whereas a national revolutionary war, guerrilla units are faced with the problem if, of internal unification of different class groups. This necessitates the use of propaganda. Both types of guerrilla war are, however, similar in that they both employ the same military methods. National guerrilla warfare, though historically of the same consistency, has employed varying implements as times, peoples, and conditions differ. The guerrilla aspects of the opium war, those of fighting in Manchuria since the Mukden incident, and those employed in China today are all slightly different. The guerrilla warfare conducted by the Moroccans against the French and the Spanish was not exactly similar to that which we conduct today in China. These differences express the characteristics of different peoples in different periods. Although there is a general similarity in the quality of all these struggles, there are dissimilarities in form. This fact we must recognize. Clauschwitz wrote in On War, quote, Wars in every period have independent forms and independent conditions, and therefore, every period must have its independent theory of war. Lenin, in On Guerrilla Warfare, said, quote, As regards to the form of fighting, it is unconditionally requisite that history be investigated in order to discover the conditions of environment, the state of economic progress, and the political ideas that obtained 
the national characteristics, customs, and degree of civilization. Again, it is necessary to be completely unsympathetic to abstract formulas and rules to study with sympathy the conditions of the actual fighting, for these will change in accordance with the political and economic situations and the realization of the people's aspirations. These progressive changes in conditions create new methods. If in today's struggle we fail to apply the historical truths of revolutionary guerrilla war, we will fall into the error of believing with Tzu Su Sheng that under the impact of Japan's mechanized army, quote, the guerrilla unit has lost its historical function. Zhen Shishan write, writes, In the olden days, guerrilla warfare was part of regular strategy, but there is almost no chance that it can be applied today. These opinions are harmful. If we do not make an estimate of the characteristics peculiar to our anti-Japanese guerrilla war, but insist on applying, it, applying to it mechanical formulas derived from past history, we are making the mistake of placing our hostilities in the same category as all other national guerrilla struggles. If we hold this view, we will simply be beating our heads against a stone, and we will be unable to profit from guerrilla hostilities. To summarize, what is the guerrilla war of resistance against Japan? It is one aspect of the entire war which, although alone incapable of producing the decision, attacks the enemy in every quarter, dim diminishes the extent of area under his control, increases our national strength, and assists our regular armies. It is one of the strategic instruments used to inflict defeat on our enemy. It is the one pure expression of anti-Japanese policy, that is to say, it is military strength organized by the active people and inseparable from them. It is a powerful, special weapon with which we resist the Japanese and without which we cannot defeat them. We'll continue with chapter 2 on page 13. This is on guerrilla warfare by Mao. And if I may make a comment there at the end, for our information war, the regimented armies, I consider that to be journalists. I am not a journalist. I'm a commentator. I'm an analyst. But I don't do any on-the-ground journalism, really. You know, mostly I'm just kind of reading what other journalists have done. And the first video in PFC Season 2, I talked about how it's important for us to protect our journalists because they play by different rules than we do. They do the actual on-the-ground work. We commentate on it. But also, their reputation needs to remain untarnished, so they're not allowed to play dirty the way that we are. I'm willing to go out there and tell jokes and insult people and go after other commentators with reckless abandon because I'm not a journalist. You can't smear me. I can say what I want. I'm an everyday citizen, and I come from the people. So I'll let them hit me, and in fact, I want them to. I'm there to protect journalists. So the way I see PFC and commentation, the way that most me and the uh, people in the INN as well, most of us don't do anything other than give analysis and fill people in on the news, but we are there to protect journalists and we are therefore mostly separate from the journalists. We have a few journalists that work with us, but work in the INN. But anyway, it is our function to protect journalists because we can, and because we can take the hits that they can't, and they're not allowed to come out here and call people names and, and really call people out the way that we are. So that's PFC, that's guerrilla warfare. I'm looking forward to the rest of the book. Hope you guys are too. Keep fighting that good fight out there.